The Word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Following our customary procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer in order that we might be properly and academically prepared to concentrate on the teaching of the Word of God. Therefore, let us pray. Heavenly Father, because we belong to Thee, we have the right and privilege of fulfilling the function of our priesthood by listening to the teaching of Your Word. We recognize that our growth, our orientation to life, our understanding of Your plan, Your purpose, Your design for each one of us is based upon the constant, daily, consistent assimilation of Your Word. We recognize, Father, that there is no substitute to your word, that there is no capacity for our life that can be counterfeited apart from what we have because of thee. Thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. We thank you for providing for us this portion of your word. May God the Holy Spirit now sanctify us to the nourishment of our soul, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Welcome once again to our daily doctrinal Bible study through the YouTube of the Vic Malbido Evangelistic Ministry. Today we have a new lesson, the doctrine of soteriology. First of all, man, or all members of the human race, is given stimulus by God. The stimulus is the cross, where our Lord Jesus Christ died spiritually. Now once man responds positively to the stimulus, then he is being baptized by God the Holy Spirit, putting him into union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is eternal relationship. Hebrews 2.9 says he tastes the death for every man. 1 John 2.2, 2, he is the appropriation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So that's union with Christ on the uh, top circle. But on the bottom circle is fellowship with God. This is temporal. Now, my question is, for whom did Christ die? The answer is, for everybody. But for whom did it save? The answer is, for nobody. The unbeliever has to have three things to get eternal life. One, he has to have in the mentality of his soul a knowledge of the gospel. That is when evangelism comes in. Knowledge factor comes first. Then God the Holy Spirit performs His convicting ministry. He causes the unbeliever to comprehend, to understand, to perceive it. He shows to the unbeliever that it is the true way of salvation, and He convicts the unbeliever on the unpardonable sin. And this is now cycled into the command post of the unbeliever's soul, his volition, and he responds to it. You see, positive volition, 
the desire pole. Negative volition, lack of desire. Positive volition, softness pole. And negative volition, hardness pole. Now, if the unbeliever responds positively, that is, he wants eternal life, whatever may motivate the unbeliever to accept Christ as Savior. He knows God exists. He is afraid to die. He wants the forgiveness and cleansing of sins. He is looking for purpose in life. He is tired of the turmoil and the problems in his life. He is fed up and bored in life. He is seeking the solution to the problems of life. Whatever individual thing or combination of things turns the unbeliever positive to accept Christ as Savior. When there is a positive response, that positive response is what activates the unbeliever's faith. So now, with his activated faith, it is energized and it becomes an appropriating faith. And what does he do? He believes the gospel message. It is an inside job. It occurs in the soul. And God, in His omniscience, knows exactly when it happens, if it happens. God knew it in eternity past, whether or not it was going to happen, and exactly when it did happen. And God imputes from the sovereign design of His plan. He has authority. He has volition. Out of His authority, He makes that choice. Here is the decision. He appropriates Christ, that is, he believes in Christ. And God instantaneously from his sovereignty imputes eternal life. Now there are three things the unbeliever has to have. Number one, knowledge of the gospel. Number two, positive volition. Acts 2.38. The key word here is knowledge of the gospel. So, number one, in Romans 10, 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, this is part of the doctrine of heathenism. First, they have to have knowledge of the gospel. Second, they have to have positive volition, Acts 2.38. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Third, they have to have activated faith, Acts 16.31. So, number one, knowledge. Number two, desire. And number three, faith. Three things. Now, this is how an unbeliever gets eternal life. One thing that goes with it is the cancellation of the unpardonable sin. So, this new believer now has, number one, eternal life. Number two, eternal security. Number three, there is now no way that he's going to wind up in the lake of fire. No way. His faith in Christ has delivered him, has saved him from God's eternal judgment in the lake of fire. So in effect, God provided the way of salvation to protect members of the human race from God. Now having said that, does faith save the unbeliever from the lake of fire? The answer is yes. And there aren't works involved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, We have been saved by grace through faith. This salvation is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now so, this is through faith, activated faith. So this salvation, it says, is a gift, a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should brag. You see, 
If man could work for salvation, two things would be true. Number one, God would owe it to him. And that's something that will never happen. God is not indebted to the creature. It is the creature that is indebted to the Creator. So if man could work for salvation in the first place, God would owe it to him. And secondly, man could brag about it. That's pride. That's the opposite of grace. Not of works. In order that not any member of the human race may brag. Now, his faith in Christ saved him from the lake of fire. Yes? The answer is, of course. So the question is, did his faith in Christ save him from the lake of fire? Of course. And what kind of faith is that? Activated faith. And what activated faith is that? The answer is positive volition. Activated faith is a kind of faith activated by positive volition. And get this, this kind of faith is phase one faith. While the kind of faith mentioned there in the book of James in phase two, or this is phase two faith found in the book of James. Phase two faith is the faith rest life. So let me repeat the illustration of salvation by faith. Here is the point of salvation, the cross. That is God's stimulus to man. And then when man responds positively, then God the Holy Spirit baptizes him and puts him in union with Christ. That is union with Christ. That is the permanent condition that's in the operation top circle. So part of this permanent condition, he becomes a member of the royal family of God. He has eternal life, all the 70 plus blessings. His name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He is imputed God's righteousness, sealed by the Holy Spirit. He is born again. On the bottom circle is the fellowship with God. This is temporal condition. Filling of the Holy Spirit. Purchasing, redeeming the time. Produces divine good. Well, of course, that concerns about gold, silver, and precious stones. Divine good. Now, aside from that, he has divine viewpoint, historical impact. He's walking in the light. Is walking in truth, walking by faith. Colossians 2 6, which says, As you therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, in Luke 11 27, while Jesus was saying these things, one of the women in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. Verse 28, but our Lord said, on the contrary, blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. You see, the Christian life is every believer's life. In John 8, 12, then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. Christ is the only light of the world. This world is dark because this is governed by Satan who is absolute darkness. This world is full of human viewpoint which is darkness. Only God's word, divine viewpoint, lightens or illuminates this world. But even if you are a believer, you can still be in darkness with your life. Do you know that? When you as a believer have no Bible doctrine, then you're walking in darkness. But don't get me wrong, your salvation is intact. Yes, you are saved, but your life here on earth is full of misery. Your life has no meaning, no purpose. Again, you are saved. 
abundant life is only found by a believer inside God's protocol plan or divine dinosphere. Utilizing God's word that includes utilizing God's 10 problem-solving devices. In verse 34, the eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is clear, your whole body also is full of light. But when it is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Verse 35, then watch out that the light in you is not darkness. Verse 36, if therefore your whole body is full of light with no dark part in it, it will be wholly illumined as when the lamp illumines you with its rays. You know what? Religion has all the darkness that she can offer to the unbeliever with all of her false doctrines. The opposite, Christianity has all the light that she can offer to a believer with all of her truths, God's divine viewpoint, God's word. Truth is light. God's word is truth. Let us pray. We are grateful, Heavenly Father, for the wonderful privilege of examining these things together, which are so important, the mechanics of which do really help us understand grace and be able to distort all of the legalism out of grace so that by that separation we can advance with acceleration to the point of maturity, for we glorify Thee. May God the Holy Spirit then challenge us to persist in our study, for we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.